or two. Everybody, welcome to the uh, Transportation Committee. Uh, this is a public hearing. Uh, today is December 11th, 2019. Um, welcome to the City Council Chambers. Uh, please <coughs> turn off your cell phones or put them on mute or something. Um, and if you intend to testify today, there's a sign up sheet in the back. We are going to leave some uh, time at the end. This, is a, this, uh, this committee has a relatively short hearing slot. Um, although I don't believe there's a five o'clock hearing. Or there is. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave some time at the end for public testimony, uh, albeit brief um, from each individual. Uh, to my left, we have Vice Chair of the Committee, Councilman Leon Pinkett from the Seventh District. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To his left, we have Councilman Dr. John Bullock from the Ninth District. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to my right, we have Committee Staff Jennifer Coates. And to her right, from the Council President's Office, Kaylin Young. We have represent representatives here from the Parking Authority, from City DOT, from MDOT and MTA, and, um, and from the Mayor's Office. Um, thank you to everybody who's here to join us uh, to hear about uh, the Central Maryland Regional Transit Plan uh, and the effort that is uh, has been underway for a while now, um, and the collaborative work that's taking place between the Baltimore City Department of Transportation and MDOT MTA, and um, uh, I'm thankful to have you all here today to, to talk about this, uh, share uh, what this means for Baltimore and for the region. Uh, are there any opening comments from uh, any of the other co committee members? Uh, Lynn? Without further ado, I believe there's a presentation uh, from our agencies here, and I'd love to hear it. We um, tag teaming again? What we do you guys call we are. yourselves? There's going to be all kinds of tag yeah. teaming here. Yes, it's, it's like going to be great. It's more like a Survivor Series. That's okay. right. <laughs> <I love laughs> it's different. It's a Survivor Series. All right. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, Council, thank you for having us here today. Um, my name is Kevin Quinn. I'm the administrator and CEO of uh, MDOT MTA, and here to talk today about uh, the regional transit plan. Um, uh, regional transit plan for Central Maryland is a tremendous opportunity for the region. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to take stock of what we have, uh, what we need to do, what we uh, have funding to do, and what we have the opportunity to do. Uh, some uh, fantastic data analysis has been done to date, um, and. Uh, uh, I'm really excited about this project. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity for the region. Um, without further ado, I'm, I'm actually going to turn it over to um, Holly Arnold, our deputy administrator. She's going to walk through uh, the presentation and uh, walk you through what we've done to date, all the different plan components, our public involvement. And then uh, Director Sharkey will be talking about uh, Baltimore City's role uh, as it relates to the regional transit plan. Great. Thank you. And just as each person comes up, uh, be sure to speak right into the mic. and. Uh, identify yourself. Thanks. All right. Thank we you. are we are being televised or recorded for. Great. Uh, and quick question: How do I change the slides? Is there a? Okay. Oh, I got it. Okay. Thank you. Liam will do that. So I'm Holly Arnold, uh, Deputy Administrator at M.MTA. Thank you, Council, for having us here. Really excited to talk about the Central Maryland Regional Transit Plan. I'm going to talk mostly about the process and the work that we've done so far, and then turn it over to Director Sharkey to talk a little bit uh, about Baltimore City DOT's role. Um, so, next slide. To the best of your ability, speak. I will talk closer into the mic. There we go. Okay. Uh, so, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Um, we're guided by uh, Maryland Chapter 352, so it's a bill from the 2018 session uh, to that requires us to develop a 25-year plan to meet the needs of the core service area. And so the core service area is defined in the legislation as the five jurisdictions that are listed here. So it's Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel, Howard, and Hartford Counties. Um, so outside of that, like, why is this important? Um, you know, public transportation is essential to the daily lives of, you know, thousands of Baltimoreans, access to jobs, getting people around the region. Um, so with this plan, we're having the first time for having some leaders in the Baltimore region um, coming together to develop a vision to improve transit um, over the next 25 years. So the priorities that are going to be set in this plan will help to influence where and how transit is most improved for the years to come. Next slide. So we are working very closely with a number of project partners. Um, so I've listed most of them out here, uh, primarily the Baltimore Metropolitan Council, the Regional Transit Plan Commission, which I'll talk about on the next slide, uh, the public. We're doing a lot of public outreach 
<clears throat> to make sure that they're heard in this process. Uh, public transit providers, so in this region right now, there are six transit providers, and we need to make sure all those voices are heard. Uh, subject matter experts helping with the analysis. All that's coming together, and MTA is going to put that into a regional transit plan. So the commission um, has been defined in legislation, and I apologize, there's one mistake on this slide. Uh, we're working with 11 uh, commissioners. There's a representative from each of the jurisdictions, uh, so Baltimore County accidentally got left off there, so, but they do have representation, um, as well as representatives who are appointed by the governor, uh, the Speaker of the House, and the State uh, Senate President um, representing um, business and transportation organizations, as well as the Rider Advisory Councils. Um, and Theo is the very capable representative from Baltimore City DOT. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the schedule for this, we're required to complete the plan by October of 2020, and we've shown our current schedule here. Um, this allows us to complete that plan in that time. Um, so we've created kind of three phases for this plan, analyze, propose, and publish. Uh, so for the first phase, phase, which is the analyze phase, that happened um, March through kind of June of this year. So we took a look at how our region is doing um, in a number of different factors, compared that to peer regions to see where there are areas where we can look for improvements. Um, during the proposed phase, which was the next uh, phase, we took that information from the analysis of like where we're kind of falling short, areas where we can look for improvement, areas where peers are doing things better and we can look at them for best practices and put those into um, proposals for uh, corridors, which is required by the legislation, looking at corridors for infrastructure improvements, as well as looking for other strategies that would help to improve the rider experience. So there's a number of things outside of just um, corridor and infrastructure improvements that will, will help riders in terms of like fare collection, real-time signage, uh, bus shelter and stop amenities, things like that that really make a difference that aren't included in that corridor. Um, we're coming up uh, in December, so that's our last part of the proposed phase. So we'll be meeting um, here in Baltimore City this coming Friday um, to have our commission meeting to prioritize the corridors, uh, talk about other network improvements, so the things that, aren't, uh, that are service related but aren't necessarily infrastructure for corridors, and talk about strategies for the plan. Um, we'll then take that, write a draft, come back in April with a draft plan, and have a lot of public outreach in April and May to get feedback on that. In June, we'll present an updated plan that shows how we've um, react responded to that feedback, and then finalize the plan in September, which allows us to meet that October 2020 deadline. So the legislation required the commission to give us input on goals and public outreach. Uh, so in working with the commission, there are three goals that they came up with. Um, first is to improve connectivity and integration of existing and future transit services, uh, to optimize existing transit services, and then to enhance fiscal sustainability. So there's a number of kind of sub-goals under these three, but these are the three goals that the commission did create for the plan. Um, outside of that, we are proposing that we use these five components to structure the plan. So these, plan are, these components are basically intended to communicate what will get better if the plan's implemented. So for that, it's basically how to provide faster and more reliable service, uh, grow ridership, increase access to jobs and opportunities, enhance the customer experience, and how do we prepare for the future. Um, so in terms of each of these, they're very interwoven. No one component is more important than the other. Um, success in one really relates to success in all. Um, so for each of these, these are the, the top, you know, the five high level. There's a number of strategies underneath each of these that will help us to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so basically, you know, if we're su successful in this plan, travel time, reliability, and ridership will improve, um, as well as access to jobs and opportunities will increase via transit. Uh, public involvement is a big part of the plan. So MTA is uh, using kind of these three guiding principles when we're asking for feedback. Uh, so first, make it easy. Meet people where they are. We are going out and doing a lot of pop-ups. So we'll go stand at a high ridership bus stop or a high ridership uh, rail station. Uh, we go to libraries. We go to shopping centers. We're trying to talk to both transit and non-transit riders to get a, fee a feedback from people for like, if they're not riding transit, why aren't they and what would uh, get them to do that. We're trying to make it interactive. So a lot of experience where people can connect directly with the RTP staff. So if they have questions about something, they are able to talk with our staff directly. Um, and then finally, uh, sorry, and we've had three, or we've had uh, two rounds of open houses. So for, there's five jurisdictions. We've done five open houses each time in each jurisdiction. We're trying to get around to the different areas of the jurisdictions to make it easy for people to come to us. And then finally, uh, make it comprehensive. So we're giving opportunities for people to 
uh, provide feedback to us like with high-tech resources. So we've had online surveys, we're doing social media, we have a website, as well as more low-tech stuff. So you know, the in-person meetings, we have a phone number, we've had people call and ask us questions about the RTP. So make it so that anyone who really wants to connect with us has that ability. Um, and I think we've been pretty successful so far with uh, outreach. We have uh, did a survey. We had over 3,400 people complete that survey. Uh, we've done over 45 outreach events and talked to more than 1,400 uh, people. We've heard a number of key themes that we're trying to weave into the plan. Uh, those include incre increasing regional connectivity and access to transit. I think especially when you talk to people more in the, the jurisdictions outside of the city, they feel they need more access. And I think there's a lot of discussion about connectivity across county and jurisdictional lines, right? So like people don't stop traveling just because they reach the end of Baltimore County into Baltimore City. Crossing those lines and making that easier is something that we've heard a lot. Um, investing in facilities, so talking about how we make it easier when you're standing at a bus stop. Shelters and uh, benches are something that we hear a lot about. Uh, making service more efficient and reliable, uh, and then finally addressing personal safety and security concerns. There's a lot of concerns about like waiting for transit as well as security while you're on the, on the vehicle. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Director Shargi. Good afternoon, everyone. Steve Sharkey, Department of Transportation. Uh, just wanted to give you a brief overview of our BC DOT and RTP overview. So uh, on June 17th, 2019, Mayor Young appointed uh, our esteemed Theo Nyong'ong, close. Theo, you all know him, uh, to serve on the RTP Commission. Uh, Baltimore City will be hosting the next one Friday, December 13th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. in the Charles Benton Building for the fans. BCDOT's participation with RTP Commission has helped to strengthen uh, valuable relationships with Baltimore City's neighboring suburban jurisdictions and increased suburban support for transit investment makes it easier for BCDOT to advocate for additional state funding to support MTA. So in addition to pledging support for increased state funding towards MTA, uh, BCDOT has taken a number of internal steps over the past several months to back up our support for improved transit service. Our 2021 capital improvement plan is being managed by Transit Bureau Chief Charles Penny and Robert O'Brien. And uh, although our FY 2021 has yet to be approved, uh, preliminary, the agency is committing increased resources towards capital investments designed to complement and enhance transit service. Uh, so potential investments include, but are not limited to, transit signal priority, bus bump outs, dedicated bus lanes, ETC. This is, of course, has to, it's, uh, has to be used on roads because this is federal money primarily. Uh, so <clears throat> BCDOT's proposed FY 2021 CIP currently includes an earmark for 10 million in federal funding over the next two years reserved for road improvements to enhance transit service. Uh, we will need to find matching partners matching that money, uh, but we're pretty excited that uh, not only have we been working much closer with MTA, uh, so you know our once a month meetings have turned into other one-off meetings. It's not just, hey, let's meet because we have to. I feel like we're trying to really build a partnership uh, uh, because, you know, 66% of their business is in our place, is in our uh, jurisdiction, and more than 30% of our people uh, ride there, rely, not only ride, rely on their service. So we need to work together closer. So not only are we working, trying to work together and forging a relationship, we're also putting uh, more money than in future years will be used towards uh, improved transit service. Uh, so if you want to be more informed, visit the RTP website, rtp.mta.maryland.gov. I'm excited about this phone number. Uh, sure, Holly, uh, is, is, it a, is it your cell phone? No. <laughs> yeah, and then RTP at mtamaryland.gov. So um, we'll kick off questions with the tag team. Thank you. Um, I know I've said this in previous uh, hearings of this committee um, and publicly on social media, but again, I want to reiterate how inspiring it is to see DOT and MTA work together. Um, when we took office, I, it was my, it was my uh, general sense that um, this is not something that really happened um, and that the city 
essentially shrugged its shoulders at any sense of responsibility to do anything that would help transit that it doesn't own and operate um, to work better. That the, there was a sense that the city could do little to nothing to uh, better transit um, and, and transit rider experience in the city. And we just know that that's not true. And it's very clear that the people presenting here today know that that is not true. And, and we are moving in a markedly uh, better direction here. Um, I did send a kind of a page of questions along um, to Holly in advance of this. Um, could you speak to some of these things um, that, I, that I raised um, just generally? I think we know that this is important for Baltimore. Um, uh, you know, why is this important and like, what will happen if we don't do something successful here? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, this is very important to the Baltimore region. Um, you know, as I said before, you know, public transportation is essential to the lives of, you know, Baltimoreans. As Steve said, people in the city, uh, there's a lot of people in the city who do rely on this, uh, on the transit system to get them around. Um, so, you know, if we, if we do this without a plan, uh, you know, we'll continue kind of with the status quo, the way we've been doing things. I think this is really an opportunity to design and implement thoughtfully a transportation network and make sure that we are getting together as a region to have these conversations and to put forth priorities so that we're focusing on a integrated regional plan rather than kind of scattered transit improvements throughout. One of the things that I think relates to this, um, a question that arose during uh, your presentation, um, is uh, whether in the proposals and publications phase of this, um, one of the considerations are land uses and land development practices that um, work against the goals mm -hmm. of um, transit service delivery and reliability, frequency, um, and you know whether we're able to connect people to jobs, whether homes are being built in places that are out of the reach of transit, and uh, we're working against our goals. Is that something that's considered or any recommendations are being thought about? Absolutely. We've had a lot of discussions about land use and how land use impacts transit. Um, the last commission meeting that we had, we talked a lot about transit readiness and like what really makes a corridor ready for transit, uh, which is mostly land use, right? Like are there destinations where people can can and want to go to? Are there sidewalks? Are there things like that where people, like all day activity, um, is it being thoughtfully designed and planned so that people can get to those areas? Uh, in the, the report itself, we have some recommendations around land use and things that the jurisdiction should do. Ultimately, the state doesn't have entire control over that, so it's, it's recommendations that the jurisdiction should implement rather than things that the plan itself would implement. Would there be any recommendations about what jurisdictions should not do? We're focusing on the positives, so we want to focus on the positive things that, that we should do to encourage, like these are the things that make transit work in different areas. And uh, would there likely be any kind of recommendations about um, how we could incentivize jurisdictions to do the, what we should do, what they should do? Um, so we talk a lot about uh, the transit-oriented development, and so that program does have some incentives that are b built into it. Um, so we talk about that, and we talk about the state programs that currently exist that help to incentivize that. Incentivize that. And so if we're succeeding, if we have a successful plan and we're moving in the direction of a uh, strong implementation of a good plan, when will we know? What's a, what's a reasonable timeline for expectations of the kind of delivery of measurable impacts and results and what do they look like? So we're still working with that on the commission in terms of prioritizing corridor, corridors, prioritizing what some of the strategies are going to look like. Um, you know, we have set out kind of short, medium, and long-term opportunities that we've identified within the plan. Um, it's really hard to say specifically like when things will be implemented because I think there's a lot of things that it depends on in terms, especially you know, funding, political support, jurisdictional support, all of those things. But that looks like um, improved, uh, increased ridership. Um, Yes, like, are, are, we, are we setting out in this plan targets? Um, you know, I mean, for example, if roughly 6% of people in central Maryland commute by transit today, what are we trying to take that to by 2025, 2030, 2045? 
So this plan, because it's as large as it is, right, so we have five counties, seven, six different transit agencies who are operating within it. It's intended to be kind of a high-level roadmap. So in order to set those targets, we would really need to get deeper than we are in the time that we have and with the, the, the size of the um, area that we're looking at. Um, we don't want to just set targets without a basis in reality, right? So we want to make sure that we're doing the analysis and have the ability to set those targets that we can reasonably achieve. So this plan is kind of the high level. As we get into individual projects, uh, individual corridors, I think that's really the time where you'd want to do the modeling and think about like what the targets for those should be and make sure you're setting something that's realistic. I'm going to pass to one of my colleagues here. Councilman Bullock. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, one of the things you noted um, in terms of key themes you heard was around investment. So my question is around investment beyond facilities and then road improvements, as you've mentioned. So things like fleet, technology, signals, timing, even uh, additional modes. I see uh, Jimmy here, something about light rail or streetcars. I mean, uh, just thinking about in terms of being comprehensive, how much of that are we looking at, too? So we've included a number of different strategies that encompass that. So we've recommended uh, real time and additional stations and, and stops throughout the system. Uh, real time on the uh, transit systems that don't currently have that. So right now I think uh, Charm City Circulator does, uh, and, and, and that MTA does, but a number of the other ones don't. Um, in terms of technology, uh, the facility infrastructure that you mentioned as well, um, signal timing and transit signal priority are some of the things that we've identified as ways to like better speed up transit. We're trying to be very comprehensive with what we're thinking there. Okay. Thank you. It's being suggested that you should speak more cl more directly into the mic. I'm sorry. I will speak. down. You can move the mic. There you go. All right. There you go. John? Uh, I, I, again, one of the things that one of the challenges has is connectivity, right? So again, if we look at the you know the challenge in terms of getting across jurisdictions, um, how much of that have you uh, have delved into? Just, just curious in terms of how people are getting from one jurisdiction to another, just thinking about where some of the job centers are and where people are being employed and the difficulties that some have in terms of that commute time and so um, ways of trying to bring that down. So we have looked at, in our analysis, um, origin and destination pairs, which is really like where people are traveling to and from. Uh, so we have that data from the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. We've looked at where people are traveling to and from today as well as where it's projected to happen in the future. So this is a 25-year plan, so projected for, out through 2045. Um, we've looked a lot about where jobs are and where they're projected to be, where people are, where they're projected to be. Um, and we've also looked at like where the people are who are most likely to use transit. Um, there's a transit propensity model that kind of looks at to which, which people tend to use transit more. So we've incorporated all of that into our analysis. Um, and so with that, we've come up with 30 different corridors that could uh, use some infrastructure improvements to better help make those connections. Thank you. And those are on the website if anyone wants to check them out. Just to, just to add something real quick, you know, we're also really taking a close look at, at barriers to that connectivity as well, right? So um, fair media, right? So fair collection from Hartford County Transit is very different than what we collect at M.MTA. You know, when folks have to buy two or three different types of fare passes to get where they want to go, that's a barrier that we can, we can do something about. So we are taking a look at that kind of technology, those kinds of barriers, how we overcome those barriers as part of this plan. Why are, there, why are they buying two and three different types of fare passes in Hartford County? Yeah, so, so if you're uh, take, taking Hartford County Transit to a Mark station, Mm -hmm. You're buying a Hartford County Transit bus pass, and you're buying and then a Mark pass. It's, it's not an integrated system. And, and where you look at successful regional transit systems elsewhere in the country, country internationally, what you see are integrated fare systems where it doesn't matter what system you're on, you, you buy your fare one time, and, and that does it. And that's what we should be having here. So we're, um, I purchased Mark passes last time I went down to D.C. for my honeymoon. Uh, a couple months ago, um, and I bought that with the Charm Pass, same thing that I use sure. to um, purchase my bus passes. I rode the bus here this week. Um, is that your MTA would be, MDOT would be looking to incorporate other, like local jurisdictions, fare uh, services into things like the Charm Pass? So, so I think it's a possibility. I don't wanna, I don't wanna presume, I mean, so other systems, um, you know, they've made their own investments into their fare collection technology. And so I think one opportunity is, yeah, you know, we can 
absorb those and uh, have Harford County Transit say recognize the Charm Pass, for example, right? And we can do some back end stuff. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, sitting here today, those um, reciprocity agreements from other counties to MDOT MTA look like, you know, we, we've gone and tried to collect them, right? And they look like those pieces of paper that you see that have been Xerox 30 times and you can barely read anymore. Okay. That's what they look like. And so this is a great opportunity to take a fresh look at that. And, and maybe it is the charm pass, maybe it's something else. But either way, it's a barrier we've got to overcome. Thank you. Councilman Pinkett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my initial question, I guess, has to do more with the state of good repair. So when, when we think about the, I guess, it's the $2 billion shortfall that's identified in the, what's the, the CTP, and then thinking about the, um, the capital needs inventory and the lack of resources that are being committed to the system, how, how do, you know, as we move forward with this plan, how do we, you know, address the, the needs of the system um, and, and how they fit into this regional plan with the um, seemingly lack of investment in, in just maintaining the, the present system that we have, let alone expanding it and, and enhancing it. Yeah, so it's really important that we maintain the system that we have. Um, we had an early commission meeting discussion about state of good repair, the importance of it, and why it's needed. Um, went through MTA's needs as well as the locally operated transit system's needs, which also have the funding gap. Um, so we've incorporated within our strategies um, opportunities to, to kind of close that, that uh, to make sure that all of our assets are in a state of good repair and to make sure that we're maintaining our safety critical assets in a state of good repair um, as we currently are. Um, but yeah, we uh, have identified that we need to continue to look at funding sources. It's not something that will be in this plan, but like uh, future studies would be identified as part of this plan. So you said that, so there'll be future studies um, that will go along with this plan that'll speak more to? So we're recommending the like there's sources. different ways to look at funding different projects, different things, and so that those would be future studies that come out of this plan. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously that's the, the critical piece because, I mean, we, we can create all of the plans we want, but if we, if we don't identify the, 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 the revenue and the, the, the streams of, um, to, to really um, support the plan, then um, then, then it ends up just being, you know, um, an exercise. And so, um, it, it, you know, it, it troubles me that, and, and this isn't anything on you all, but it troubles me that we're struggling just to maintain the system as it is and getting the investment um, that we need to ma maintain it and with the understanding that we know it needs to be expanded and it needs to be enhanced. And we can't even get to the enhancements because we, we are, we're stuck keeping, just keeping together the, the current system that we have. Um, you know, I don't know what that will take, but it's, it's definitely going to take another level of advocacy on all levels to make certain that we get the kind of resources that, that we need. I mean, I know Director Sharkey mentioned the, the funding that they've identified in the CIP for federal funding to go towards transit. And I think that's one really great first step that, you know, I'm excited that the city came to us and, and mentioned that they were interested in it and we're working very closely with that. So I think, you know, things like that as much as possible we can do is, you know, a great first step to, to start getting there. Um, if, can I ask this Please. One? So um, I, I wanted to, and, and I know that this might be, um, be one of the questions that Chairman Dorsey um, submitted um, to the group previously, but, but just talking about the, the concern as it relates to um, getting, helping to individuals um, get reliable transportation to centers of employment. Um, I, I think that um, outside of maybe, you know, getting our young people to school, some of the things that we hear the most are, you know, um, people's ability or inability to rely on transit to get to centers of employment. And so can, can you just speak a little bit about that and how um, this plan will address some of that? And if we've identified, you know, um, gaps in that and, and if we've identified maybe new areas where employment, we expect employment to grow and how we're anticipating that, you know, with this plan. Yeah, so we've looked at the, the plan and where, um, you know, employment is, where, where employment is going to be. Um, have you seen our transit priority initiative work that MTA is doing? So that's basically looking at our frequent transit network okay. um, and looking at areas where we can kind of speed up transit. So we look at a, a whole bunch of data, but essentially like where things are going, you know, where transit's going slower than cars, where we're getting stuck for a long time. No, I, I, I'm, I'm correct. I, I have. Okay. I, I have yeah, so we're, we're looking at, so there's a lot of infrastructure improvements that we can make to make transit more reliable, right? If a transit is getting stuck at a light and can't get 
it through for several cycles. Like, can we look at changing the signal timing or doing TSP on that particular light? And so we've got a lot of those infrastructure improvements in here, including additional dedicated lanes, additional TSP, um, Q jumps where possible uh, that will help to really speed up and make transit more reliable. Um, and then outside of that, MTA continues to work on improving the reliability of the, you know, the current system. That's one of the big goals is to improve the on-time performance. And so that's going to continue uh, outside of this plan no matter what. No, and, and it's interesting. And, and I wish I could remember who I was having this conversation with. Um, and it was about the, 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 the notional perspective of um, our, our public transportation system. And, and the, this person, unprovoked, the way they described it to me is that the, the way that our system operates, and this is, I'm, I'm just saying that the way it was said to me, the way that our system operates is that it's a system for poor people. And the reason they say that is because it's not reliable. And so anybody who has choices don't, wouldn't choose our system because of the unreliability. And so it ends up being a system for individuals who don't have choice. And that's really the, the, the antithesis of what our system should be. It should be the system because of its reliability that everybody, regardless of status or station in life, uses. And until we get to that place, that, that's really the barrier of, that keeps our system from being a, a system like we may see in some other jurisdictions. So. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely. Reliability is hugely I mean, important. Yeah, just to respond. I mean, so you, know, you guys have heard me talk about reliability nonstop. Uh, it, it's, it's, um, uh, I'll readily admit the unreliability of, of the MTA at times. I, I'll also um, uh, readily admit that we made some great improvements over the past yeah. few years and that we have become more reliable. I think we've, you know, in introducing the transit app and having real time on, uh, on, on cell phones and buses running more on schedule, that that's providing people with information uh, to make those choices. You're right on. We, gotta, we need to be more reliable, and, and that's something that we're going to continue to focus on um, so that it doesn't have that kind of stereotype uh, to it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge Delegate Brooke Learman. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I uh, kind of want to piggyback on what Councilman Pinkett was just asking. Um, you know, about, I guess I want to hear a little bit more about like what parts of the existing uh, like frequent transit network uh, need the most intervention to help get um, more people where they're going faster and more reliably. If, there, if Have we identified particular places, and I know that you did mention uh, the 30 um, corridors um, it, that have particular attention given to them. And then also, what destinations uh, in and outside of Baltimore City um, uh, that are not part of that current frequent transit network are most important to connect to via new frequent transit network. And then the other part of my question, though, is can we do that effectively um, without investing similarly in the frequency and reliability of the other lines and modes of connectivity to get people to those corridors? If I've got to wait for an un reliable, infrequent route in order to get to my transit point, uh, to, to my transfer point, um, at, are we adequately improving things along those high it, it focus corridors? Yeah, so we've looked at it as an entire network to identify um, areas that, that need improvement. I mean, again, we have the 30 corridors. I can kind of list some of the, the early opportunity ones that we've identified, although they haven't been officially um, blessed by the uh, commission. That will happen on Friday. Um, you know, those include you know, Morgan State to the kind of South Baltimore area, uh, Glen Burnie into, into downtown, um, Towson to downtown. So it's most of our kind of frequent transit network uh, lines that exist already. Like those are ones that, you know, people ride. There's a lot of ridership. There's a lot of destinations along those. And so those tend to continue to use, need to use inf uh, infrastructure improvements. Um, we've also identified a number of kind of like network improvements. So areas that don't currently have um, especially when you get outside of the city, they, they maybe not have light, um, late night service, they may not have weekend service, things like that. It's like those services that can be improved to get people to the, the high frequency corridors. So again, like those five plan components that I mentioned earlier are really all interconnected and we wanna make sure that those are all done together. Uh, you, you know, as you say, like if you do the high frequency corridor but it's really hard to get to it, you're not gonna have the same effect as you would if you don't do everything. 
Um, in terms of the job markets that we've identified, in terms of like a, a lot of trips that are going to be generated, uh, Port Covington has been identified, uh, the Trade, Port, Trade Point Atlantic area, uh, Columbia, uh, the Columbia kind of downtown Columbia area has a huge number of jobs that are growing, as well as Fort Meade um, and down in uh, Anne Arundel County. And, and I think of these things as a representative of Baltimore City. I think of the number of people who, from I guess various points in Baltimore City, need to connect into a place like Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, but is this also looking like at how other places throughout the region are also connecting into Columbia? And is there like a realistic uh, likelihood of improving Baltimore's connectivity at the same time that we're also trying to connect other points connectivity? Um, uh, and, and if so, like is that detracting from the focus of Baltimore as the center of the region and the sustainability that can be achieved by continuing to grow population and opportunities for Baltimore City. So, you know, the early discussion for the corridor prioritization does have a lot of the uh, corridors uh, within Baltimore City as, as early opportunity corridors. Um, I think that's where a lot of, like, it's most ready in terms of transit readiness, right? Like, the land use supports it. There's people who are going to ride that transit and, and destinations where people want to go to. That being said, there are still a lot of needs in the counties and the local jurisdictions that, like, aren't being met. And so we want to make sure that this is a, a comprehensive regional plan and so that those needs are identified and uh, recommendations for improvement in, in those areas. So I mean, because the thing is, like, if you get to, to downtown Columbia, but there's no local circulator to get you to your job, that doesn't really help, right? Like, we've got you there, and then you're still kind of stranded. So like, those areas need network improvements to make sure that that service exists to get people to those final destinations. Um, as a complete streets guy, and somebody who spends a lot of time looking at how the designs of the physical street, the built environment, um, not only impact the, um, the way that transit and people move along segments of corridors, um, but how those designs enhance um, the quality of life in those segments, neighborhoods. Um, can you, and can we hear from DOT? I, you know, I want to hear, um, I want the people seeing that camera and everybody here to to hear more about like why this is important um, what can be expected and delivered um, in helping Baltimore's neighborhoods where unemployment is relatively high how these things how how the investments even on a regional from a regional lens um, can help not just get people from job from where they live um, in high concentrations of unemployment to where jobs are somewhere else, but how these investments help to grow the likelihood of jobs growing in the neighborhoods where our investments in the street incentivize growth and incentivize a higher, you know, promote a higher quality of life right there in neighborhoods where people live. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go? I'll give a general statement. I don't know if that was a question, but I think I'm in agreement, that, or DOT is in agreement, and that's why we're really trying to work hand in hand with MTA to improve the routes, to make the bus routes stable, uh, reliable. That's very important. A bus route in front of my house is not worth nearly as much if the route is not reliable. So you know, we haven't found the exact pressure points where we can get big, bigger wins or even medium or small wins quickly, but we're meeting frequently to talk about what can we do to make the bus system as a whole, especially as it comes through downtown, move quicker. And people need to realize that almost every bus route touches downtown at one time. So if it gets bogged up in downtown, then it goes up to Mondawmin. It, it doesn't get up to Mondawmin. So uh, I think we're working together because we do believe that improving the bus system reliability will make it make the bus system longer term more sustainable because, it, again, it, it won't be the last resort, as Councilman Pinkett said. So we want to improve reliability. We want to work together to find sections of roadway that could be improved to speed up buses, uh, especially during high peak travel times, and improve the bus rider experience, but also uh, improve the experience for our residents. So some of the people in here might not ride the bus, but a lot of our people ride the bus. And 
you know, we might not see them here at City Hall because they're working a 2 to 11 or they're working a 5 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, so, it, you know, we need to really think about them, uh, the people that might not have time to come to these meetings and are working the, you know, a hard job and if, taking it bus an hour or two, two you know, if changeovers. If I could perhaps be a little bit, more, I guess, more clear about what I'm asking about. Um, we know that there is a high concentration of buses that come through downtown and so creating bus lanes and clearing cars out of the way of buses downtown is kind of a no-brainer um, but that's not where the concentration of unemployment is i'm concerned about when drivers uh, from outside the county or even drivers from around baltimore city neighborhoods are saying over my dead body are you going to take away one of my car lanes in order to create a bus lane and we have to be realistic in saying that we can't improve uh, bus service and encourage much higher usage of bus service along corridors in and out of the city unless we give up car lanes and create bus lanes through from the county line to downtown not just in downtown and and I want to know why people why what we should be saying back to drivers about why quality of life is going to be improvement improved and why non-drivers in those communities can expect for jobs to grow in their neighborhoods and higher quality of life in their neighborhoods because we give up some space for cars in their neighborhoods well i mean oh, does liam you want to jump in on this so we go we got survivor yeah, I'm, series I'm gonna jump in everybody on the, jumps in i'm going to jump in on the jam session um <laughs> and the thing that i the thing that i really like because we're having internal conversations about how we're going to market complete streets as we get closer to implementation and the thing that i like is seeing it as like the roads baltimore city roads are going to be designed for baltimore city residents essentially whereas over the past 70 years we were prioritizing cars and a lot of times when you did that you were kind of dedicating the roadways to people who were coming in from outside of the city. So essentially we should be looking at this as an opportunity to give the roads back to the citizens of Baltimore City and to benefit them. And it's not just cars, it's pedestrians walking, it's people using transit, it's people using bikes. Um, so I, I, I like that idea and I, I think we've talked about that a lot. Yeah, no, internally. of course, uh, just not, you know, pedestrian safety as well and you start off with pedestrian safety in a local neighborhood and a, you've got a roads that are built for cars to move through that a lot of these roads weren't originally built for that they were originally built for horses and people walking so you know we definitely want to I think I said this to somebody I forgot who it was the other day I said like we have to remember that we are a city and that should be our goal and that's why people come here we got to play on our strengths of being a city so you know, and that, that extends to the whole city. We're dense, pretty dense the whole way through. So I, I certainly think that's important uh, with the complete streets legislation. And that, uh, like Liam said, goes across pedestrians, bicycles, and all other bus transit forms of transit and moving. I'll, I'll just chime in just real quick. So, you know, I think, I think we stand um, ready certainly to partner with Baltimore City DOT. I mean, I, I, I think to your point, better transit is better communities, right? That's communities where people can live, they can walk to the bus stop, and they have a bus that is, uh, they can rely on that's going to show up on time to get them to work, to take them to places on the weekend, to get them to the zoo, right? Um, I, I think one of our big pieces is, for example, um, the bus stop design guidelines document that you know we put out that talks about how to right size bus stops so that we don't have bus stops that are cramped into these small places because we're trying to maximize parking. We can make that bus stop what it's supposed to be for an articulated bus because 400 people a day use that bus stop, right? And, and that bus stop needs to be appropriate for that community, not for the cars right there on, you know, parked on the sidewalk. So um, uh, our, another piece for us, uh, not just the bus stops and, and right-sizing them, and, uh, is also the spacing of those bus stops, right? And I know we take a lot of, uh, a lot of heat for this, but we uh, have some pretty specific standards that are in that document for how we space out those bus stops. I think that's also a key piece. We're also in the process uh, of installing, we're always installing bus shelters. That's also a big one for us because when we do those bus shelter installations, we also include um, ADA improvements and ADA accessibility when we do that too. That's a key piece of that because communities also have to be walkable. <laughs> 
The bus is no good if you can't walk to the bus, right? We like to say 100% of our bus riders begin as pedestrians, and so they have to be able to get to the bus stop. We gotta make that bus stop accessible as well, and that's again where we can partner with Baltimore City DOT. My time's up. <laughs> Um, I have a couple other questions for MTA and, and one other for DOT, um, and then we, I want to get to some public testimony here. Um, since you brought up bus shelters, um, bus shelters are not something that city DOT does. Uh, is there, does anybody know of any pool of money that's out there that we could be going after that would help with this? I mean, I know that we have, um, uh, transportation alternatives like four to one matching grants that we could be going after for things like bikeways and things like that. Um, are those are there grants like that that we could be going after at the local or at the state level to get assistance so that we could do more, if not from the state level, from the local level? So I'm not aware on the local side, but at the state level, the, definitely the transportation alternatives program, we're working, we've identified the, the stops for us that are highest priority to get shelters to make those pedestrian improvements and the ADA improvements. Um, and so we're trying to work with the local jurisdictions to put together packages that would apply for the transportation alternatives programs, as well as there's some safe, safe routes to school funding as well that we can go for on the state level. Um, on the state level as well, we have um, our STIG program, the Statewide Transportation Investment Grant Program, which is supposed to, or Innovation Program, which uh, has provided some funding for things like this as well. So we would encourage, you know, Baltimore City DOT to apply and we'd be happy to, um, it's hard to help with an application since we're judging that application, but we can, um, you know, provide some thoughts on that. Uh, on the federal level, there's the Bus and Bus Facilities Program. Um, so MTA did apply, on, we were unfortunately unsuccessful, but we were looking at the arena. Um, that's one area that is a multimodal connection. It's a really big transit hub. Uh, we did work with the city. They're supportive of this project. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful at the federal level, so we're going to kind of repackage, rethink what we're, we're doing, and see what we can do to, to go for some funding there. Uh, thank you. Um, and on, in your presentation on outreach by the numbers, uh, you have 3,426 surveys completed. Do you have any demographic information from those surveys? I do, but not on me. I can send it to you. But, and is that going to be? Like it will be in the final plan report. We're going to have a, a technical chapter that really goes into the um, outreach that we've done, and it has all the numbers in terms of demographics of who we spoke with, uh, where the people were coming from. So we did we did a big uh, outreach push and um, social media push to make sure that we were getting people from all over the region to respond to that survey. And does that include race? It does, yeah. Race, age, uh, gender, the typical demographic information. Thank you. Um, and I think the last thing I want to ask um, before we take some public testimony is uh, you've been going around to the different jurisdictions and having meetings in different places. Um, I know that Theo is our representative. Um, is it typical that the representative is, is somebody from within the local jurisdictions like DOT or Public Works or something like that, not the county executive? And do the county executives typically participate when you're having meetings, when that jurisdiction is hosting the meeting? Right, so uh, it depends on the jurisdiction. Like, I, they're from all kind of different departments, so there's no one profile. Uh, it was really up to whoever the county executive or the, the mayor chose to appoint. Um, the, when we've been to the, the previous counties, yes, the county executive has come and spoken at the beginning. Okay, and do we expect from, we have, uh, we've been joined also by Matt Stegman from the mayor's office. Do we expect Mayor Young to be participating uh, and be present for the meeting on Friday in the Benton building? Uh, I do not believe that he will be present, but he will be sending greetings and information. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a number of people signed up um, for testimony. Uh, I would like to invite Delegate Learman to come up if she would like uh, to speak. Um, thank you. Um, I will be brief um, and non-substantive. <laughs> I will simply say how important I think it is that you all are holding this hearing. Um, it is. There's no way that MTA can be successful um, in moving Baltimore residents without input from the city council um, and without a strong partner in DOT. 
Um, and so as a state representative, I obviously work very um, hard to make sure that we can be supporting MTA and also holding MTA accountable. Um, but there is a need at in every local jurisdiction, but especially in Baltimore City, where we rely so heavily on MTA, our students rely on it, our citizens rely on it, our businesses rely on it, the port relies on it. We are so interconnected here and we need it to be working so well. Um, so I'm just really grateful that you all are holding this hearing um, and I hope it's the first, uh, I know you're having MTA come a few times, um, but I hope that you'll continue to be involved in the regional transportation plan uh, process as well. Thank you for mentioning there is the meeting this Friday morning um, and I anticipate that they'll have more uh, council meetings throughout the next year. The plan is due in October and there's a lot of need for input from representatives, from elected officials who hear from our constituents on a regular basis about our transportation needs. Um, so I just encourage you to continue to be engaged and be active um, because there's a lot of work to do um, to make sure that we get from here to where we need to be. So thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you so much for your leadership on transportation. Um, we actually only have one person who checked the box for testify. Uh, so I'm going to uh, invite Ian Knudsen from the Sierra Club up. You said my name right. <laughs> I don't know how else I would hey, that, say that, it. That is a, a feat in and of itself to say my name right. Well, so I wasn't going to call you Ian. No, oh, my last name. Oh. Ian Knudsen. Um, I'm actually a resident of Howard County, so thank you for, for letting me come here today. Um, I'm here with Sierra Club, and I actually liked, I, I wasn't really going to speak, and then I heard the comment about coming from Columbia to work in, in Baltimore. And I just laughed because I just started a new job about five blocks that way, uh, 50 Albemarle Street, and uh, I live, got the Cheesecake Factory, got the Columbia Mall, my townhouse is right there. So I would literally be one of the people who would be using this system because it would be so close to me if it were reliable. And that being said, I can honestly say that because I grew up in Europe where I always used public transportation. We don't have school buses, we don't have any form of anything. I used taxis, I used subways, and I used buses to get around. And I did that. I went to different countries. I went from Germany to Italy to Switzerland, all by public transportation, yet I can't go 20 miles, 15 miles in my own state, in my own city, no less, reliably. And so I, I sat back there and I thought to myself, and I thought, okay, guess it's time to go check that box. So uh, I came up here and I, I would urge you to realize that, that the buses will go both ways. Just because I'm from Columbia coming to Baltimore for a job doesn't mean that somebody who doesn't live down here in Baltimore will hop on that bus that I get off of and ship right back up to Columbia. So jobs start at many different times and, and it may just work out that this may be something that benefits all of us perfectly. So I'd, I'd really urge you to look at this as, as a, a total uh, optic and not just a Baltimore issue or a Columbia issue, but as a truly regional issue. So thank you. And um, if I could ask you a question. Um, so you, uh, you work for Sierra Club or you volunteer? Or volunteer. You volunteer. Just, yeah. uh, Sierra Club is um, obviously uh, environmentally concerned. Um, can you speak to any concerns that you or Sierra Club has about the environmental impacts and the rem that the benefits of improving. There are a plethora. So there's the greenhouse gases, the lowering emissions from cars. There's uh, better health for people who then have to walk to the buses. You're finally getting a little bit of exercise. So there, there's so many different aspects of of what can be benefit be beneficial of, of all of this. But my my biggest Thing and that I, I personally believe is the greenhouse gases. By reducing the amount of cars that people are taking, by reducing times, by getting more people to use public transportation, we're now utilizing the emissions that we already have. Those buses are running whether people are on them or not. Whether they're late or not, they're still going to be running that gas. Whether they're sitting there broken down, not moving anywhere. Um, these are all still expenses to us that we're incurring and 
to truly have a system that operates, that connects, that runs, that people are utilizing will not just mitigate those costs because then you're actually using them, producing something from it, but you'll be reducing the amount of cars and the amount of people on the roads. So does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah, right. it's good to hear these things. Um, thank you for your testimony. Yes, Brian. Uh, Come on up. Come on up, please. I wanted to. I got your name on here. I just don't have a check mark. I missed it. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm Brian, Brian O'Malley with no the Central check Maryland O'Malley. Transportation Alliance. And um, I want to echo um, what's been said a couple times, how important it is the level of partnership um, that we're seeing between the city and the MTA uh, and, and reiterate that the MTA can't perform what it needs to perform without the cooperation of the city. Um, and that's at every level from DOT and the staff to the city council forming this committee and having this hearing to talk about the regional transit plan to our delegation. Um, and we saw that uh, on display at the roadshow hearing a few weeks ago, it was, it was more coordination and consistency of message than I've ever seen do, you know, from the advocate standpoint. So thank you. Um, I wanna urge um, all of us here to not let this regional transit plan sit on a shelf when it comes out. And of course, there's a lot that the MTA and the state can do about that, but there's also a lot that the city can do. Um, this hearing is a great start, but let's not stop here. Um, the, the CIP and the federal dollars being programmed to, to implement improvements on some of these corridors is another great start. I understand there was a hearing last night that I wasn't able to make about Gay Street and um, improvements there where the, the transit priority toolkit is being put into effect. Um, but let's not stop there. Um, what are the, you know, the city can have its own priorities um, that it wants to see in this plan. As, as, as Holly mentioned, the commission meeting on Friday is about establishing what those priorities are. So, you know, what is the city bringing to that conversation? What does it want to see as priorities, both in terms of corridors, but also in terms of measurable outcomes, like, like you asked about Councilman Dorsey. Um, what are the targets that the city wants to see for access to jobs, for speed, for reliability? Um, those can get woven into the plan. Uh, when the plan comes out, will the mayor and city council endorse it? Will it just be the MTA's plan or will the city own it? Um, will, will Baltimore City make elements of the plan top priorities in its annual priority letter? Or will it be, you know, sort of talking out of, you know, two sides of the mouth or not, you know, in silos? Um, the consistency there will be critical to this plan actually turning into action. Um, Will the city, through its empowered representative to the Baltimore Regional Transportation Board, make elements of this plan part of the BRTB's long-range transportation plan? Or will that be a totally separate effort? The consistency there will be critical. Um, there are, you know, uh, MTA mentioned in its presentation that there's a transit priority toolkit. A lot of that is under the control of local jurisdictions. So what can the city do? I, I was really thrilled to hear uh, Director Sharkey mention bus bulbs and transit signal priority, um, priority lanes. There are things that the city can do to make the buses work better. We don't even have to wait for the plan to come out. You can start to identify the priority corridors and implement some of these things um, tomorrow so that when the, when the plan hits, people start to have a sense of what we're really what we're gonna see change when, when it gets implemented. Um, so please uh, don't wait, act now, and um, set priorities uh, to make sure this plan becomes a reality. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. I think um, you, know, you remind me of one of the things that I've had in mind for many months related to this. It's that I always worry that there's, and I alluded to this in one of my comments earlier about travel to Colombia, that, that there's a possibility of us shortchanging the outcomes if we don't really powerfully exert how important Baltimore City is as the center of the region, and that if the city is not really uh, exerting as much uh, influence as possible to say we need these city focused efforts um, to be top priority or else we just become you know a, a, a region that is compromised by the 
the ills of sprawl and trying to accommodate, continuing to expand a transit network into more and more sprawling areas instead of, con instead of moving the whole region in the direction of a more su sustainable urban uh, density focused uh, manner. Um, and so it's, you know, if, if, and if we don't do that on the front end, it's almost too late by the time we say, well, the plan got adopted and it was compromised by far out jurisdictions, interests, um, and doesn't have enough in it that is really powerful enough for Baltimore to, to say, we need to make these things from the plan our priority in our subsequent priority letters. Like they really, we have to have those things in there, embracing them on the front end of things. Um, so thank you for your testimony, um, and thank you for CMTA's leadership and, and helping me to prepare for this hearing also, and being in communication with me. Thank you. Sure. I had one other question um, for MTA that um, I wanted to come back to for just one more second. Um, and again, it's about like conflicting kind of interests. Um, on page eight of the presentation, there are these three um, draft RTP goals, one of which is enhance fiscal sustainability. And again, uh, we have Delegate Learman here, and she was so critical in the effort to repeal the Fair Box Recovery uh, Act and, um, you know, where, where the need to generate revenue from this thing that's a public service was compromising or giving certain people an excuse to not expand and enhance existing services. Um, I believe that we should, and I think that probably everybody here believes that public transit should be free for all people. And uh, I want to know how we can possibly be moving in the direction of making transit free and more accessible for all people and at the same time enhance physical sustainability. And what does that mean? So for enhancing fiscal sustainability, that was one of the, uh, the goals that was proposed by the commission. Um, we have uh, come up with a number of strategies around that. Uh, including kind of working with the, um, the public transit providers and like colleges and schools, businesses, uh, military institutions, me medical campuses. Those that are kind of providing kind of competing service to public transit. Like, are there ways to consolidate that and put the funding into public transit rather than um, competing with each other? Um, talking about partnering with employers to make transit more affordable and convenient to employees. Uh, so a number of kind of commuter choice uh, options and like better ways to, to work, with, uh, work with employers on funding transit. Um, we're looking at uh, expanding um, kind of education outreach to employers on the benefits of commuter choice uh, and then making sure that we're looking at uh, regional policies to incorporate transit provision and service into development review and put up uh, possibility of impact fees, similar to how it's on the highway side, like recommending that on the, the transit side, uh, looking at funding opportunities from jurisdictions, um, looking at the Transportation and Climate Initiative Program as a potential funding source, um, making sure we're maximizing federal transportation projects uh, and seeing if we can get, get, you know, if that project is meant to benefit a private organization, can we get contribution from that private organization uh, for that as well as local jurisdictions. Um, and then looking, uh, f you know, cost efficient, uh, efficient value capture practices, um, public private partnerships, alternative delivery methods, uh, sponsorship opportunities, and transit TIFFs. Um, there's nothing in the plan currently that talks about making transit free, but we are talking about how to make it more, uh, make it easier to transfer, uh, make, take away some of that transfer penalty uh, if you're transferring between systems and like making sure it's a more efficient system if you're for fare collection. Cool. Um, do we have anything else from the rest of the committee? Um, I don't have anybody else signed up for public testimony. Was there anybody else that wanted to? Yes, Jimmy. Hey, I'm Jimmy Rouse. I'm representing Transit Choices. I think most of you are familiar with the work we've been doing over the last seven years. Um, I have to say that Ryan was an early participant in Transit Choices meetings before he was elected to the City Council, and I think we played a role in educating him. Now he's become a force unto his own, and I really appreciate your work on the complete streets and your forming this committee. 
uh, I think it's extremely valuable. So thank you, Ryan. And thank you, Leon and John, for participating. I also want to thank Kevin and Holly because in this process, I feel that they are listening and responding. Uh, we now have Steve at City Dot, I think, and Brooke in the legislature. I think we have a team here that can really create a substantive plan if we keep up the dialogue. Uh, I, I confess I lost my hearing aid to the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay a couple weeks ago, so I missed a lot, so if I'm redundant, forgive me. <laughs> there, there's only one real point I want to make, and that's about funding. I understand the plan is initiated by looking not at funding, but look at, as it should be, it's a response to the need that exists in the community, regardless of funds, and that's the way it should be. But as we work towards specific suggestions about what the priorities should be on a plan, I think it is very important that we go back and look at potential funding sources for each of the projects outlined in the plan. Um, I talked to Art Gazzetti recently, who's vice president at APTA. I think you all know APTA is the American Public Transit Association, a national organization in DC who tracks all the public transit projects through the country. And I asked him for a list of different ways municipalities and states had funded transit projects. And he gave me a list of 30 some ways that, that localities are using to fund transit pro projects. I'd be happy to share that. And I think it's important that we look at those and see which apply to our needs in Baltimore and which projects they might apply to as part of the overall process in the planning in the RTP. So I think we have a great team. Thank you all. And I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm optimistic. Thanks, Jimmy. I'm going to come back to my last question one more time. If Baltimore City were to purchase 13,000 bus passes for its 13,000 full-time employees, what kind of a discount would MTA give? I don't know. <laughs> uh, we would need to uh, we would need to crunch the numbers on that. But I'm happy to get back to you on that. Is there any sort of standard discount on bulk purchasing for we employers? Do. Um, we have a maximum of generally of a, a five thousand dollar discount um, with a uh, and a twenty five percent off of the the bulk passes. Uh, generally, we take a look at the use of the passes. So, is there a transit benefit? So, we we have in the past offered free passes if there's a benefit to um, to MTA essentially. So, what's a what's a What's well, a bus pass right now? Seventy-two dollars a month for a standard bus pass. Yeah. Seventy-two times thirteen thousand. What's that? Seventy-four. Seventy-four. Sorry. Seven. Thank you. Seventy-four times thirteen thousand uh, is nine hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars. And if we wanted to, if we were given twenty-five percent off of that, is that what you said? The bulk. Bulk passes. So that's a max of five thousand dollar discount. So take five grand what, off what, the number yo? you just I, put out. I need out better. There. What was the thing you said? Twenty-five percent off. Yeah. So, so with a max of five thousand dollars. Oh, the lesser of twenty-five percent yeah, or five thousand. Yes. So it's still a big number for you. All right, we got to have a conversation about that. That's fine. That's that's not going to work. We're it's five thousand dollars off. I don't know what the problem is. Here. Baltimore City is Baltimore City is paying eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars for six hundred people to drive their cars to work. If we're going to um, if we're going to incentivize people who work for the city of Baltimore riding public transit instead of, um, instead of driving their individual cars on any scale, uh, we're going to have to sell it to the Board of Estimates that we can, a we can actually offer transit for less than what we're offering driving subsidies. So I hope that we can uh, have a very soon conversation about that. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate everybody being here today and for being engaged on this subject and I appreciate uh, everybody who in the future is going to watch this on YouTube, the, the masses. Um, um, <laughs>
thank you to my colleagues and staff of the committee and everybody who testified and attended today. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>